everybody uh, and uh, welcome to Begaman Hall late at night where nobody's around. Um, I came in because there was a couple of experiments I wanted to do for this and grab some more toys to replenish my stock at home. Uh, so I thought why not record the lecture here in the, in the quiet of nobody around on the UNI campus. Hope you're all doing well out there. Hope you survived exam three okay. I will get those graded as soon as possible and you should have the results uh, of your exam three by the end of the week. So last time uh, we talked about uh, broadly some ideas that are foundational to understanding light phenomena, such as the fact that molecules in the air can absorb various forms of electromagnetic waves, uh, including visible light, and then re-emit photons of that light in various directions. Turns out in uh, the next two discussions, we're going to see that phenomena of molecules absorbing uh, things, but uh, we're going to change up what they absorb, but we're also going to get photons out of those, those processes as well. Uh, we talked a little bit about light traveling into different media, such as water or glass, and the fact that when it goes from air into those things, it slows down, and uh, often, if it doesn't hit the surface straight on, uh, the trajectory is also altered. That's why we see things a little weird when we're looking underwater at something. Light waves can uh, run into other light waves, and they can add up constructively to make bigger light waves, or they can cancel out if they're exactly opposite in phase. Uh, and so this constructive and destructive interference is the ultimate uh, phenomena behind why we see different color bands in soap bubbles and oil films. Uh, and finally, we talked a little bit about polarizing filters and the fact that uh, in certain alignments, uh, polarizing filters block well, polarizing filters always block some fraction of light, but if you have two filters in certain orientations, you can transmit light. In other orientations, uh, the filters can nearly block all of the light from transmitting through. So uh, back in the days where we were actually here live in person, we talked about incandescent light bulbs. Uh, and again, we were focused on this visible light portion of the spectrum. Uh, the fact that sunlight produces a lot of energy in this visible light portion of the spectrum. Uh, and incandescent lights are our attempt to mimic that. Uh, and you may recall that, you know, sunlight's peak is in the middle of that colored light, visible light spectrum. Incandescent light bulbs actually peak in the infrared region. Uh, and only a portion of the, the energy that they're putting out is in the form of visible light. So as a source of light only, they're actually rather inefficient. Uh, but that's not the only way that you can produce light, you know, heating something up so that it incandesces and gives off light. Uh, 
Today we're going to be talking about what is the phenomena that produces light a different way, which uh, produces photons after molecules have been excited by some energy carrier. And that's the underlying mechanism in fluorescent lights. So I'm assuming that most people are familiar with the old fluorescent lights. Actually, these aren't quite as old. I can still remember when this was blowing everybody's mind that it didn't wasn't just this four foot long tube of fluorescent light, but people had produced these that you could put in your various kinds of outlets. Uh, so a few questions that we want to think about in the context of fluorescent lights. What ways are fluorescent lights, if any, superior to incandescent light bulbs or inferior, I suppose? Uh, are there any drawbacks to fluorescent light bulbs? Are, uh, why do fluorescent light bulbs take time to achieve maximum brightness? Right? You flip a fluorescent light on, particularly if it's cold in your house, it takes a while for that to get up to bright light. How do fluorescent bulbs work is more of a root question that will help us answer the first three. But it all really needs to start with answering the question, how do we get light from atoms or molecules? But we're going to simplify it and just think about single atoms in this discussion. So here's our model of an atom that we need to understand this behavior. Uh, we need to use the Bohr model, which was the first one that had various energy levels for the various places that could be occupied by the electrons. And for the purposes of this, we're going to think about the hydrogen atom, which is the simplest kind of atom that you can have as one proton in the nucleus. So there's the nucleus. It doesn't even have any neutrons in the nucleus, just a single proton. But around that are various locations where the electron can be found, uh, or I suppose in the language of today, where there is a higher probability of where the electron can be found. And I don't mean to mean that these are nice concentric circular orbits. Turns out a hydrogen atom, that's not a bad approximation. But if you've taken any sort of a, uh, chemistry, you might realize that other kinds of atoms have much more complicated electronic orbits. For our purposes, we're just going to try to simplify things here. So I've drawn a few energy levels around my hydrogen atom. And the convention is to number those with the energy level that is closest to the nucleus being one and then so on and so forth as you work your way out in an atom. Uh, so, question, how many electrons would be in your average hydrogen atom? If you want to pause this and think about it for a moment, it'd be a good review. Well, if hydrogen is electrically neutral, that means I need to have the same amount of positive charge and negative charge. And so if there's one proton in the center of the nucleus, then there's going to be one electron uh, that is associated with that hydrogen atom. Okay, another question, where's the electron most likely to be found? Well, it turns out in the lowest energy state is the right answer. Nature is always in some ways trying to uh, revert to the lowest energy state. And in fact, that's a way that Aristotelian thinking was about the world, right? Balls roll downhill because that's their natural place in the universe is at the bottom of the hill, not at the top of the hill. But if you think about that in the terms of energy framework, when something rolls downhill, it is reducing the gravitational potential energy in that system ultimately. So there's a natural tendency to want to be in the minimum energy state. And so, uh, you know, quote unquote, naturally occurring hydrogen, that electron will be in the lowest allowable energy state. Now there's reasons in the model why it can only be in that energy state and not lower, for example, but we're not gonna delve into that. If you're curious, you can read much more about the Bohr model in many places online in any chemistry textbook, uh, but we don't need that for our discussion here. So you can actually do experiments and find what the energy values of these energy levels are. And by convention, they are all uh, labeled with negative energy values. With the way the model does this is it assumes that zero in terms of the energy in the system, the potential energy in the system, is when the two charges are infinitely far apart. And so everywhere else where they are closer together, because they are attracted to one another, these energies are negative. And so experiments have shown that in the lowest energy state, the energy of that state is about minus 13.6 EV. We'll get to EV in just a second. Energy 2 is minus 3.4, energy level 3, minus 1.5, uh, 4 is negative 0.85. And there are a couple more energy levels as well that you can see in the simulator that we're going to play with later. But for our purposes here, just a few energy levels is sufficient. So an electron volt are the units of energy that scientists who study uh, 
things on the small scale typically use. And the reason for that is an electron volt is a very, very small fraction of a joule. A joule is a more common unit of energy, uh, but electron volts, you get to write nice whole numbers when you're doing these atomic energy levels rather than times 10 to the minus and a whole bunch of numbers. So one electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 joules of energy. So it is much, much, much smaller than one joule of energy. But we're talking about very small things, right? Single hydrogen atom, single proton, single electron. How much energy then would it take to move an electron to the n equals 2 energy level? Well, if it's sitting in the n equals 1 energy level at minus 13.6 eV, and you want to kick it up to a level where the system will have minus 3.4 eV, you have to add energy to the system in some way, and the difference there is 10.2 electron volts. So if you have some way of delivering 10.2 electron volts to the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom can absorb that energy, kick the electron up to a higher energy level. It will only stay there temporarily, and then it will eventually decay back down into the lower energy level. When it does that decaying, it gives off a photon of light and a little bit more about photons in a minute. Now this is ultimately the same mechanism as we're talking about with scattering from the previous discussion and previous reading. But in those, you're absorbing photons of light and then emitting other photons of light. The mechanism behind discharge tubes is actually a little bit different than that. Final question on this slide, you know, what happens when the electron gets into the n equals 2 level? And I guess I already said that. In a higher energy level, typically the atom is not stable in that configuration. And so at some point, uh, the electron will go back down to the lowest energy level. And in doing so, it must release that 10.2 electron volts of energy in some form. That form comes in photons. Now, what the heck is a photon? Well, generally, if you see them symbolized in a physics book, they're driven, drawn as a little squiggle packet. Uh, photons are small particles or little packets of energy, packets of light that are given off by ultimately excited atoms. So the amount of energy that a photon has determines the wavelength or the frequency of that photon and vice versa. And so this is the same that we've been talking about with wavelengths and frequencies of various kinds of electromagnetic waves. Uh, if I have a 600 nanometer photon, I can work out how much energy it has. I can work out what its frequency is. And it turns out a guy named Planck uh, found the relationship between energy and frequency and realized that if you increase the frequency of something, you increase its energy. To me, that makes a little bit of sense because if I'm producing a wave, uh, if I want to increase the frequency of that wave, I've got to increase my oscillations that I'm producing in order to generate that wave behavior. And if I'm increasing those oscillations, I'm putting more energy into the system, and the wave is ultimately going to carry more energy as a result. So there's a direct connection between frequency and energy. If you double the frequency, you double the energy. And the constant that relates those two got named after Planck. It's Planck's constant. Uh, if you like the shorthand version of equations, E is for energy, F is frequency, and Planck's constant is an H. And uh, the value of Planck's constant is in units of joule seconds or electron volt seconds. The reason for that is frequency is in units of one over seconds. So if you multiply something that has units of energy time by something that has units of one over time, you're just left with something that has units of energy. So uh, Planck's constant is a really small number, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds, if you're working in joules, or uh, 4.136 times 10 to the negative 15 electron volt seconds, if you are working with the more common on this level uh, energy units of electron volts. And in fact, here's an opportunity to do so. So I've uh, taken that same energy diagram from a couple of slides ago and reproduced it on the right now just in a linear fashion. But this tells us the same basic information. The n equals 1 energy level has an energy of minus 13.6 electron volts. The n equals 2 minus 3.4 electron volts, etc., etc. So we're wanting to figure out what color photon gets produced if uh, an electron goes from the n equals 2 energy level down to the n equals 1 energy. What if it started at the n equals 3 energy level and went down to the n equals 1? Or n equals 3 to n equals 2? Any transition to a lower energy level will produce this little packet of energy, this photon. 
So I would encourage you to pause the presentation and try to solve the problem yourself. You need the expression on the previous slide that relates energy and frequency, but you also need the expression from previous discussions where we've talked about wave speed and how it relates to frequency and wavelength. If you uh, would like to check your answer or don't want to solve it yourself and want to watch me do that, that's what that YouTube um, link is there in the bottom of the slide. So for those of you that are following on the Google slides, you can just pause this and click that link. Uh, if not, this link is included in the announcement of this lecture being available. So how do we make a lamp? Well, ultimately, let's build it from the inside out. We need to have some sort of atom that is going to absorb energy, kick its electrons up to higher energy states, and then when those electrons go back down to lower energy states, give off a photon, a little packet of energy that hopefully is some sort of visible light photon and will produce uh, something that we can see. So how do you impart energy to this? Well, one way again is to hit it with a fo another photon. But the way that we do it in a discharge lamp is actually to hit it with another electron. So electrons, if they're moving, are carriers of energy. And if they collide with the atom, they can impart a portion or all of that energy to the atom, excite the electron that is bound to the atom to a higher energy state. And then when that bound electron uh, goes back down to a lower energy, lower energy state, the photon is emitted. So I got to have an electron, but I need it to be moving. And so the way I get it to move is something we've seen before as well, basically a capacitor. I need to have positive and negative conducting plates so that um, the electron will be um, pushed off of the negative plate, repelled off of there by the other negatives, and fly across the space in between towards the positive plate. As it does so, uh, it actually speeds up the whole way because it's got a force on it from the electric field that's created in between the positive and negative plate. So you get an electron, it gets ejected, and then it speeds up as it goes across the gap uh, in between here. And if it collides with that atom, it can produce the excitation event that then leads to the photon production event. All right, so I got to get those plates charged in some way. So yeah, all of these things are going to use some sort of power supply. Probably not a D-cell battery, but it was the simplest image I could find. Uh, so I need to have a battery or some source of power connected to these plates so that they will become charged. And then ultimately, I need to enclose this all in some sort of system so that these atoms, which are typically some sort of gas, are trapped in a container and don't just fly everywhere and then you don't have them to create your light. So that's the basic model of how you make a discharge tube. You need the atom that's going to produce the light, but then you need the electron to collide with it. You need the plates to cause those flying electrons across the gap. And then you need a power supply to those plates and something to uh, enclose the whole system. So there is a discharge lamp simulator activity. It's on the FET website. Unfortunately, it's another one that is the older simulations that only run on Java platforms. So if you know the way to disable the Java on your computer, I would highly recommend, again, get the simulator going yourself and play around with it. In my opinion, it's both a lot more fun than watching me do it on the video, and you'll probably learn more in the process. Uh, and there are questions to answer as you're working your way through the simulator, and they are included in the linked worksheet that was linked in the announcements, but is also linked here on this slide for those of you following along on Google Slides. Uh, and then those questions that come off of that survey sheet uh, constitute the bulk of the Poll Everywhere survey that accompanies this particular lecture. Again, if you would like to see what happens in the simulator but it doesn't work on your computer, you can click on the YouTube link down there. And I've done the walkthrough of the questions uh, that we look at uh, within that simulator activity. So, uh, uh, as we're winding down here, uh, this is the reason I came to Begemann because I didn't want to drag all these to my house. We have some of these discharge lamps uh, here, and uh, so the more familiar neon lamps, but there's also some other gases that we can light up. And so I uh, shot a little video here a few minutes ago uh, that shows what happens when you look at these discharge tubes, but then you look at these discharge tubes through a little device called a diffraction grating that allows you to see the various colors that comprise the light that is coming from uh, 
uh, that tube of gas. So if you are watching here, again, I'd encourage you to pause it and watch this video if you want to see those demonstrations or click on the link that's in the announcements for the same. So finally, a few more Pull Everywhere survey questions. And if you played around with the simulator, uh, you should know the answers to these. If not, you can go back and click on that YouTube link and fast forward even if you want to towards the end where I actually generate these uh, particular spectra. But which atom does this spectrum belong to? So lots of ultraviolet, a few on the infrared side, uh, and then a blue and a violet and sort of a teal and a red. What, what is that? Is that hydrogen, mercury, neon, sodium, or none of the above? Second one, similar question, but now the bulk of the visible photons that I'm seeing are just over 600 nanometers in the orange range. And there's a few that are just under, kind of yellow. Uh, and again, there's a bunch that are infrared and a couple that are ultraviolet. Is this hydrogen, mercury, neon, sodium, or none of the above? The final survey question just gives you a third spectrum here. What's this? Uh, so I'm seeing some yellow and green, a little bit of red, mostly some uh, violets and blues. Is this hydrogen, mercury, neon, sodium, or none of the above? All right, so we entitled this discussion Fluorescent Lamps, and finally, on the very last slide, we get to talking about the specifics of a fluorescent lamp. But a fluorescent lamp is at root that same thing as a discharge lamp. I send electrical energy in here in the form of current, that's electrons flowing through that tube, and they are hitting atoms, exciting the atoms, and then producing photons in the process. So fluorescent lamps actually contain argon, neon, krypton gases, as well as, and here's probably the dark side of them, a little bit of mercury. And you need a little bit of mercury to make the fluorescent lamps operate the way that they do, but they make this thing hazardous as well. And so technically, when you break a fluorescent tube, you are supposed to contact cleanup specialists to help you with a mercury spill. And I've heard nightmare stories about people that have done that. Um, I can remember, I don't know, I wouldn't say that the good old days, but I can remember in my youth just throwing fluorescent light tubes in the dumpster and enjoying the fact that they smash, but not great to do. Uh, and many communities, including locally here in the Cedar Valley, you can save your old fluorescent lights. And then a couple times a year, uh, there's a hazardous waste pickup where they will take your fluorescent tubes and dispose of them properly. So mercury is kind of the downside of the fluorescent uh, light bulbs, but uh, the advantage to this relative to incandescent light bulbs is most of what you get out of here is light. We're not producing things very much down in the infrared part of the spectrum. We're also not producing much in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, though internally we actually are, but we use that energy again, and here's how it does this. The mercury that is uh, vaporized within this fluorescent tube emits most of the light, but most of the light it gives off is ultraviolet. And so if you look at simulations of mercury, most of those photons are showing up in the columns that are in the ultraviolet range. Uh, so what happens? Well, you can play the same trick if you have ultraviolet lights uh, that are hitting the sides of these. They hit a material called a phosphor and that whitish powder that's inside the tube there if you've ever broken one of these is a phosphor and what those do is they absorb ultraviolet light and then they emit visible light photons as a result. So in truth you've got electrons striking mercury giving off photons most of which are ultraviolet but then we're coating the lamp with specialty materials that absorb the ultraviolet photons and in turn give off new photons that are in the visible light spectrum. So it's a little bit complicated if you're a fan of chemistry uh, here you go, and if you're not, um, we won't have this on any quiz or test, but uh, the lamps use two kinds of phosphors. Uh, one is a halophosphate type phosphor, and so it has calcium and a phosphate and either fluorine or chlorine, uh, and it's been too long since the periodic table. I don't remember off the top of my head what SB is. MN, I think, is manganese. Uh, but there is also europium and terbium compounds uh, that have europium and terbium, uh, as well as cesium, LA. Boy, it's been a long time since the periodic table. Broadly, really complicated chemicals uh, that would take quite a bit of chemistry to understand the whole structure of, uh, 
but we want just the root idea that again, these are materials that absorb ultraviolet and give off visible light. And that ultimately gives us visible light out of our fluorescent lamps. So that's what we wanted to talk about in this discussion. Uh, broadly, uh, the principle that when you have energy absorbed by atoms, electrons in those atoms will go to higher energy levels, but then when they lose that energy, or more correctly, when they release that energy and go back down to lower energy levels, it's energy as photons that gets released, little packets of energy, little packets of electromagnetic waves. And the wavelength of those photons corresponds to whatever the energy spacing is between energy levels within the atom. And so only certain energy spacings will actually produce visible light. Other spacings produce either infrared or ultraviolet light. Uh, if you have small energy gaps, you get infrared. If you have large energy gaps, you end up getting ultraviolet. Finally, fluorescent bulbs uh, as a second kind of light source contain mercury atoms. And the mercury atoms absorb the energy give off ultraviolet photons predominantly, but those ultraviolet photons are captured by phosphors that coat the inside of the fluorescent tube and then re-emit new photons that are in the visible light spectrum. So this is the lecture that accompanies section 13.2 in Bloomfield's book. We're getting towards the end, and if you've not yet done so, I would encourage you to take a look at that section. He does go into a little bit more detail about some of the theoretical underpinnings of this in the first few pages of that section. If you find it helpful, I'd encourage you to work on the recommended practice problems from chapter 13. And if you want to take a look ahead for what we're going to be talking about next, that's section 13.3 in the Bloomfield text. <laughs>